everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of Pop Culturally Deprived, where I experience cult hits and classics for the very first time. Today, we're going to be talking about everyone's favorite Christmas movie, Die Hard, on your Welcome to the Party Pal podcast. My co-host today is Matthew Vos. Matthew is a pop culture enthusiast who loves to keep me on my toes and is constantly adding entries into my giant list of things Mandy hasn't seen, which is linked to in the show notes. Hi, Mandy. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Anytime. I love pop culture. I'm an absolute junkie. I'm the guy who uses Spider-Man dialogue to motivate people to go get them, Tiger. Die Hard, I can't remember when I first saw this film. I know it was one of three videotapes that I pretty much had in rotation every Saturday morning for my formative years. But it's one that you can easily go back to. You know, when you're flicking around on TV and you see it's on, happy to leave it on wherever it is in the film. I can appreciate that now that I've seen it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I even once made a pilgrimage to Fox Plaza, which was used as Nakatomi Plaza, um, when I was stranded in uh, Los Angeles during the Icelandic volcano ash cloud back in 2010. Silver lining then. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so a spare week in Los Angeles trying all the free things. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, a little history on the film. Die Hard was released in the U.S. on July 12, 1988 in Los Angeles, followed by a limited release in only 21 theaters three days later on July 15th. The following week, on July 22nd, it was widely released and ended up the number three film of the weekend. The film grossed nearly $141 million at the box office worldwide, more than five times its budget of $28 million. Die Hard was nominated for four Academy Awards. Best Sound Editing, Best Film Editing, Best Sound Mixing, and Best Visual Effects. It was also based on the 1979 novel Nothing Lasts Forever by Roderick Thorpe. And a fun fact about that is that the novel is a sequel to an earlier novel called The Detective, which was also made into a movie in 1968 starring Frank Sinatra. That means that technically Frank Sinatra and Bruce Willis played the same character. Though, interestingly enough, Bruce Willis wasn't the first or even the second choice to play the now iconic John McClane. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Burt Reynolds, Richard Gere, and Harrison Ford, and I think there's a few more in there, all passed on the role before it was finally given to Bruce. And I also learned this was Alan Rickman's feature film debut. So the film had that that $28 million budget, which is not bad for an action film at the time. But five million dollars of that budget was Bruce Willis's salary. That's that's a big percentage to put to one actor, um, an actor who had done one film and had done a TV series at that, that time. Right. Well, and especially considering he was definitely not the first choice for the role. Yeah. the The story goes was that they they wanted to make sure they got someone who was invested in it, so they overpaid. And to the extent I managed to find a Chicago Tribune article about it from February 1988, they said that for Hollywood, the result is equivalent to an earthquake. The map of movie star salaries must now be redrawn. And I guess it was. <laughs> yeah, they went on to compare it to a few years before when Dustin Hoffman had been, been paid about the same for Tootsie. And about how that changed, how that, how they had to pay stars like Warren Beatty at the time. Wow. That's crazy, especially mm. since since this is really just a, a genre action film. It, it's not, I mean, it wasn't nominated for Best Picture or anything like that. No, te- technically, they appreciated it, clearly, but they, they didn't think there was anything in the story or the acting. That's fair. Which is amazing when you look at it and, and how iconic some of these roles have become. And, you know, Bruce Willis is now this major star, but this is the role he'll be mentioned for forever. Absolutely. And and John McClane is a name that even if you haven't seen Die Hard, you have at least heard that name before. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So the plot of the story is fairly straightforward. New York cop John McClane has flown to L.A. to spend Christmas with his estranged wife and children. Terrorists attack during his wife's office Christmas party, and John does all he can to take down the terrorists from within. Pretty standard action movie fare. Simple. Two sentences. He's there, they're there, and he tries to stop them. Exactly. Now, I never watched this movie when I was a kid, and I was definitely a kid in 1988 when this came out, mostly because I had a very misguided youth in which I was determined not to like anything my parents liked. If they watched it, I refused to. Uh, This obsessive stubbornness meant that I hated all action films, 
most dramas and missed out on some really incredibly quality movies and TV like ER, The West Wing, and Seinfeld. <laughs> so they had very good taste, and you just wanted to be uh, combative to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. If it didn't come on the CW between 8 and 10 o'clock every night, I pretty much didn't watch it. Or I guess back then, well, in 1988, it, it probably didn't exist. But in those formative TV years, that's really, you know, kind of where I stuck to, to what I knew and what I liked. And if my parents wanted me to watch it or told me it was good, then it absolutely was not. And I wanted nothing to do with it. And, and now you get to watch all these things for the first time with with bits of knowledge about them going in, presumably. I really had very little bits of knowledge about mm. this movie going in. If you look at my uh, 97 thoughts I had while watching Die Hard, which are also linked to in the show notes, uh, one of my very first thoughts is that I never even knew he was a cop. And that's pretty, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a pretty big plot point of the movie is that you know, it, he's a cop. It takes place at a Christmas party in an office building. I didn't know that either. I really didn't know anything about the movie other than Bruce Willis was in it and there were guns. <laughs> Bruce Willis and guns. That's, that's most of his films, to be fair. True. <laughs> True. Um, so did you have any expectations for the film before you saw it? This time, I actually did expect to like it because fortunately for me, I am no longer in that crazy, misguided you know, frame of mind where I hate all action films. I actually quite enjoy action films now. And I appreciate the, the stunt work and the, the plot and the characters. And I'm a big Bruce Willis fan. And so I don't know why it took me so long to finally sit down and watch it unless it was just me being stubborn that I didn't want to watch something that was so popular from so long ago. <laughs> But when I finally realized that this was a movie I was going to watch, I fully intended to enjoy it, and I did. Good. Have you seen any of the other Die Hard films? I have not, although I was very tempted in 2013 when I believe number five came out. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, because I am one of those people who, if I haven't seen the first one, I'm not going to see any of the other ones. Like, I have to watch them in the order they were intended. So and you, it you just might never miss happened. out on the plot. Oh, yes. There's, you know, so, so much detail here that you'd lose coming into other films like this. So. <laughs> you, you say you like Bruce Willis. Have you seen much of his other work? I have seen The Fifth Element. I have seen The Sixth Sense. I have seen... Pulp Fiction now, um, though that will be a later episode of the podcast next week, actually. And I'm sure I've seen others, but I'm blanking on movies where he was top build cast. Yeah, he's very much a genre act, act, uh, a genre actor when you say that. You know, lots of action films and lots of guns and lots of big blowing things up. There's a, a few comedies in there, but not many. I'm I'm trying to think of a comedy that, that he's in, and I, I'm sure I've seen one. I just couldn't tell you what it is. The one that comes to mind is Death Becomes Her. Uh, oh, yes, yes. I was obsessed with that now. movie when I was a kid. I always forget that's him because it doesn't look like him at first he, glance. Yeah, he has, he has a lot of hair in that one. <laughs> <laughs> and a mustache. Yes. So, absolutely. Yes. Very different from okay. Die Hard. Very different. Um. So... Die Hard, you hadn't seen it before, and we want to talk about it in its, you know, pop culture sense. Um, it, it's a film that is littered with with pop culture references to American culture, cowboys, westerns, cowboys and Indian shows. But as a film, it is its own pop culture reference. Heroes, villains, action films, different plots within films. There, this, this is one of the film, one of the uh, movies that a lot of that is based on in, in modern cinema. There, there is a phrase, die hard on a, to describe other films. So, do you have any experience of the other big die hard on a whatever film? So, like a presidential plane for Air Force One, on a bus for Speed, or in a very big child-friendly house in Home Alone? <laughs> well, I can say I've never heard that expression before, but I am familiar with all three of those. And there's there's a lot of things that when you watch them, you go, yes, we can see where they got the idea from this. Down to episodes of Star Trek, where you have uh, Patrick Stewart in his vest running around the Enterprise on his own, taking out the uh, the villains. That is true. Die Hard on the Enterprise. 
<laughs> That's, I like that a lot. It's good. Patrick Stewart in a vest, brilliant. Take it any day. Patrick Stewart uh-huh. doing anything is brilliant, and I'll take it any day. So, <laughs> so before we get into the, the meat and potatoes of the discussion, did you like Die Hard? I did. I did. I liked it more than I thought I would. I know I, I just said that I went into it expecting to like it, but I really enjoyed it both from an entertainment perspective and also just kind of thinking about it thematically and trying to do some analysis of the movie while I was watching it which is really difficult to do with a movie like Die Hard because it's so fast paced and you're constantly just trying to kind of keep up with the action and so having you know the secondary thought processes is is a little difficult but I I enjoyed every second of it. Even yeah, pl- when I was frustrated with the characters on the screen and what was happening. Yes, it's it's a smart film. It moves at absolutely a click, and it, it's just over two hours. Um, so there's a lot of content fit into that time. But it's not perfect. There are things you'll pick up on it and go, mm, that's, that's stretching my uh, credulity right there. There were a few things like that, yes. <laughs> do, do we want to run through any of them? In fact, shall we do a quick run through the beat, beat by beat? And we will, we will see what moments pulled you out of it. Okay. So we start off, we, we've got uh, John McClane, Bruce Willis on a plane flying to Los Angeles, as you say. And that, that sets us up for about 15, 20 minutes of characterization. Uh, nothing much happens, but we are putting all the pieces on the board and getting everyone set. So he comes in on the plane. He has his ride with Argyle in the limo. Uh, he looks up Holly at the, the uh, reception desk at Nakatomi Plaza. He meets Takagi, he meets Ellis, and then he meets Holly. And whilst this is going on, we get a few uh, flashes to uh, mysterious, ominous-looking vans driving into the building. And then, finally, everything starts kicking off. We have the arrival of the terrorists through the lift. They take out the guard. They come in firing. And John McClane is stranded, barefoot, in a vest, trying to get away from all the gunfire. Like you say, it's a really, really quick start. There's a lot going on, and we're introduced to a lot of characters and a lot of relationships very, very quickly. Once he then sees all the terrorists, uh, he escapes off, he he runs away, and he starts his uh, wise-cracking smart mouth. We, we've seen a little bit of that in, in his, you know, sort of blue-collar everyman and the way he gets on with the people around him and the, the side references to stuff. He and Holly have had a bit of a fight, which he admonishes himself for. But now he starts uh, having discussions on his own, out loud, and playing both parts of it. It's not even single lines. He says, why didn't I do this? Well, because then I'd be dead. <laughs> I laughed at that part. <laughs> he's he's not the most stealthy. And if you're going to run around trying to hide from people, you don't have conversations. <laughs> but at least he was barefoot, so he was making less noise running than he would have True. been in shoes. True. Fist with your toes. Um, it then switches and we have uh, Alan McMahon, Hans Gruber and he, he is driving everything at this point he has a plan, he pulls Takagi out he uh, kills Takagi and, and starts setting up what he's actually there for the, the $640 million in bearer bonds John, I think in your um, description of this you said John does everything he can to stop them but all he's doing to yes. start with is he's calling the fire brigade he pulls the alarm and he hopes the five people will turn up and the authorities will sort it. When that doesn't work, he then gets on the phone to the police and he tries to get them in. So he doesn't want to go and engage fully for a good chunk of this film. All he's looking to do is just get people in to help because he knows he's one man up against too many. Right. Well, I mean, the smart thing to do is to try and get the law enforcement into the building. Absolutely. And then finally you have the arrival of Al. And I think from, from your notes, the, the five or six notes about the same thing that you put, this is something <laughs> that, that stood out to you. Yes, I was so frustrated. <laughs> what what was it that actually caught you out here? Well, there, there were a couple of things, actually, even right before we got to Al. The, the police not taking John McClane seriously when he's trying to tell them that there are people who have taken over this building with guns and they're just yelling at him for using a secure channel and not even listening to what he's saying, that frustrated me to no end because I don't care if it is a prank call. Those are the sorts of things that you should be checking out. And of course, it's a plot device to 
frustrate us and to keep John in conflict, but it's frustrating to watch. And then when Al finally does show up, he goes outside. It's a very, very quiet night in L.A., which is weird because L.A. is not a quiet city, but it's a quiet night. And there's machine guns being shot on the roof of this 30-plus story building that should (laughs) have been audible throughout the city. And Al didn't hear it. Nobody heard it. (laughs) And I don't understand. I just, I, the laws of physics don't work that way. Maybe they do in this world, but I could not understand how nobody could hear all of these machine guns just firing. I mean, we're not talking a single solitary shot from a handgun. We are talking about multiple machine guns shooting at metal, at people in the air from the top of a skyscraper. And that should have been echoing at least around the block, if not around multiple city blocks. And it didn't, and nobody believed that there was a problem, and it drove me crazy. It's Christmas Eve, Los Angeles. Everyone's gone home. They've gone back to all their, you know, Midwest farm farm towns they came from. No one actually comes from Los Angeles, surely. They will just uh, move there. <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely that's, that's right. That's a fair point, but... <laughs> and I had to check it because I had a memory of being able to see the gunfire that's one of the things that pushes Al over there. But it, it's just the lights to, to show that it's a tall building. Right. Not, he's, he's even seen that. I, I will defend the film slightly. They do tell him to go across, I think, as a code two, which is no sirens. So I suspect that's a go and investigate, but don't raise alarm. Which is fine, because with no sirens, he should have even been able to hear the machine gun fire <laughs> even better yeah. because there was no siren to cover it up. <sighs> okay, I will stop. <laughs> Los, Los Angeles smog just stops out <laughs> from traveling. Maybe, <laughs> perhaps. Um, no, Al, Al finally arrives. Um, he's driving away and the terrorist is thrown out at him. Welcome to the party, pal. Absolutely. And that's, that's a great moment. It's the hero shot, you know, the rising camera through, through the, the wind and the, the gap in the window. And that's when we know it's serious and he is, everyone knows he's there, he's having to take things out and he's finally got support. Al's reaction did not inspire much confidence in me. I will say that. Um, I, and, and in my notes, you'll see that. I was very frustrated with how quickly he fled the scene, terrified, and then kind of just drove off an embankment. <laughs> um, <laughs> he did, of course, end up calling for backup, but his by the end of the movie, I loved him. I did. I absolutely 100% loved him and wish he had been in charge of the op. But in this moment, between his apparent machine gun deafness and his <laughs> inability to be a confident cop in the moment really just made me wonder why this character was even in the film. Of course, they, I mean, they did inspire confidence in me later but his first introduction did not leave me feeling as if john mcclain was going to get any help no and and there's no one who seems to want to help him even even the the nakatomi employees weren't weren't particularly nice to him when he arrived um holly didn't really want to spend time with him he is a man alone absolutely i think it's about here that john and hans uh, start talking to each other uh he gets the radio and we have the you know mr mystery guest we have the the Roy Rogers references. Um, and then finally, the police arrive. So we have... Finally. finally, we have the showdown with the police and we have the, the SWAT team barging in. And one of my favourite moments is the SWAT team coming in and catching himself on a, a thorny flower. Which is just terrific to have taken that moment in a film that's so congested. Fab. I'm not even sure I caught that watching it. <laughs> I was too busy yelling at the screen, honestly, because I think at this point I was yelling at them, if John McClane can see you coming in, so can the terrorists. So they weren't being stealthy, and I was frustrated, and I was mad at, I guess he was the deputy police chief, because he was an idiot. And yes, he is. He, so he I is think I, I missed all... some of those smaller points. <laughs> the, the whole SWAT team thing is uh, frustrating when you're rooting for the police. Uh, particularly because they they go and they try and unlock these glass doors. You know, they're, they're, I get that they're trying to get in stealthily, but at some point you can just knock the glass out. 
Right. With your big guns and big tank thing. So the SWAT team is taken out, and it, it's hard if you're rooting for the police. It's excellent if you're rooting for the terrorists. We get some some good comedy from Theo. We get some good moments, and we get that huge explosion from John McClane. And now we have uh, a bit of a turning point in the film where Ellis goes and talks to Hans, and he goes and tries to, to get them all out, and, and he compares himself to the criminals. He compares the criminals to the businessmen. And you start you set up this uh, triangle of people having a go at each other. Hans is killing people. The police think John let him die. And, and John just thinks no one is out there to help him. Well, John's mostly right there. I mean, he did everything he could to save Ellis's life over a radio. Yes. I mean, he did. And I don't understand how a deputy police chief could not see that when he could hear the entire conversation. Yeah, because he is terrible. And as much as we're not made to like Ellis, we are not made to like the deputy police chief. Oh, well, it did not hurt my feelings one bit that Ellis died because Ellis died of his own... It was his own doing because yes. he decided to try and be, I don't know. He, I think he was trying to be a hero, but he was just stupid. He was he was trying to play them at, at their own game, and he is not Alan Whitman. Yeah, yeah. Um, it frustrated me, and I felt worse for John than I did for Ellis, and Ellis is the one who died. So, <laughs> what what this gets us to is uh, John has been taking out all the terrorists, which means Hans has to go and finally get his uh, get his hands dirty, go and do something, and you have the meeting between uh, John McClane and Hans Gruber. Bill Clay. Bill Clay, which is it, it's it's superb, and it's it's lovely because you have a moment earlier when uh, he shoots Takagi, and John doesn't see Hans Gruber. It, it it always feels to me like, oh, he, he must have seen him. He knows, and that's how he knows him from earlier. But the the way they stage it, he does not see him because he's hidden behind a screen. Right. I, I didn't think he had he had saw him. And, and so my reaction during this whole scene was, come on, John, you're not really falling for that, are you? That accent work is terrible. And then he changed his accent midway through. It was like, <laughs> come on, you can't really be that stupid. And then he handed him the gun, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, he really is that stupid. But... I was very pleasantly surprised that he's not as dumb as he looks. So I, you know, when, when Hans goes to shoot him and there's no bullets in the gun, I was very happy. And um, I like to talk to my TV when I'm watching movies, when I'm really invested in them. So I was kind of cheering a little bit right there. Do you think John knew he was uh, not a hostage or do you think he just had a suspicion? I think he knew. I think mm -hmm. from everything I can tell, I mean, I've, I only know the character of John McClane based on the actions that he does in this movie. I don't know about his life prior. I don't know about his time as a cop. I just know that he is a cop. But he's he's handled himself very well through this entire movie and in this situation trying to save people trying to take out the bad guys. And so I can only assume that he's very good at his job. And that means he probably has a really good intuition when it comes to things like this. And so my assumption, once I figured out that he didn't trust him, that he gave him a gun that had no bullets in it, was that he knew that it wasn't a hostage. If One, there's no good reason a hostage would be up there. Um, that someone who is acting as, you know, plain and Midwestern as Hans was, this, this person would not have gotten away from the group when they were killing people. And so I think he knew. There's there's no situation in my mind that I can think of where John McClane would have actually fallen for it and thought he was a hostage. The, the thing that gives me just pause to question it is that he doesn't shoot him. He, he engages him. He has a conversation with him. He doesn't, you know, he's not getting information out of him. He's not trying to uh, figure out the big plot or anything. I just, he's not been the most merciful so far. He's pretty quick to shoot guys. That is true, but he was unarmed. Yes. So far, and, and... he has only shot people who were trying to kill him. That is, that is a very good point. So what this this takes us to is uh, the great bit where the, the plot un unveils 
and they start shooting at each other. John is hiding, and everyone's shooting and throwing grenades at him. And you have uh, Hans showing that he's, you know, taking in all the details around him. And he, he shouts to Carl, she's Dane Fenster. And you just get this blank look from Carl. Just, I don't know what you mean when you speak German at me. <laughs> but, which, which gives us the, the opportunity for Alan Rittman just to give him a look and go, shoot the glass. <laughs> <laughs> As a side note, the, the actor playing Carl is actually Russian. So I... I is it that he's meant to be a Russian terrorist? Is it that he's uh, German but didn't hear him? Don't know. But it, it's a lovely moment. Well, uh, you know, okay, fun fact. I actually did some research about this movie after we watched it, and I found out a couple of things. One, the German that they're speaking throughout the movie is not actual German. It's just gibberish. Okay. <laughs> um, two, in the German version of the film, they're not German terrorists. They are just an Eastern or a European terrorist outfit. Um, and so <laughs> I don't European. know that, that they intended to actually flesh that out that much. Okay. Um, in, the, in the U S version, it was intended to be German, um, but it wasn't. Oh, interesting. The, uh, the Russian actor actually defected to America. He was a ballet dancer, Carl. And when, when they were on tour in America, he actually asked for asylum and ended up staying. That's really cool. Really strange. I wouldn't have said he was a ballet dancer. No. He's graceful, but in the sort of Jean Claude Van Damme way. But it would not surprise me if Jean Claude Van Damme ever did ballet. So. That, that's that's fair. That's, <laughs> that's research for a future film, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> so Hans has finally fired a gun, and you have the the next bit of characterization. This is pretty much the last time we're gonna we're gonna deal with character so much, is John pulling glass from his foot. Oh, I hate um, that he, scene. It, it it is brutal. It's really hard to watch. It's not you know it's not Psycho where you don't see anything in in you know uh, in the flesh. He is pulling glass from what looks like a very lifelike foot. It is not uh, and... a, a, an actual foot though. It is made out of rubber. Yes. And another fun <laughs> fact for this scene is that um, in production there was supposed to be a sound effect, and the producers made them take it out because it made it too gruesome and too realistic. <laughs> like like a sickening pop when it comes out. Yes. <laughs> um, and I'm um, glad they didn't do that because that was a pretty. I mean, I I not I'm not particularly queasy, but watching people pull objects out of their body while there's blood everywhere just doesn't really work for me. Yeah, and it, it really fits with the scene for him bearing his soul at this point and saying, you know, she's heard me t say I love her, but she's never heard me say I'm sorry. You know, he knows all his problems. He knows how you know his mouth gets away with him, and he's trying to you know find a way to make up with it for the only person he can speak to. Yes, that scene though, for me, the hopeless romantic would have been so much better if Holly had been like in the same room as Hans, so that she could hear him over the radio and actually hear him saying those things that he was trying to say to her. That would have made it. So that would have made the ending, I think, better for me, just because I'm a hopeless romantic. But that's just me. And and skipping forward, it might almost have covered up the, the one section that pulls me out a little bit, which is how he figures out that she is married to McLean. That moment where he hears her children talking, it, it there's a leap going on there. Not a huge leap, not enough to say it's you know a, a massive plot hole, but him suddenly noticing this picture that's been down since the beginning of the film, you know, Chekhov's lying down photo frame. Um, I, was that not because they they said the children's names and their last name was McLean, or did I make that up? I don't think I don't think we see it, but we do also not see all of the uh, interview with the children. So who knows? Okay, it didn't pull me out. I think my brain made the jump too, but of course I already knew. So yeah. That might just be something we have to whistle past. Um, but back to where we were. He pulls all the glass from his foot, and we, we go off, and we see the next stage of the plan, um, and it's the, the FBI arriving, and the FBI playing the terrorist playbook uh, stage by stage, which means shutting down the electro electrical grid for the entirety of Los Angeles. I don't think that can be done from a radio, just telling someone to do it. <laughs> Maybe in 1988 it could? <laughs> Maybe there's some guy Maybe. sat in the main station with a switch and he just throws it. I'd like to think there's a few more safeguards to someone <laughs> shutting down a city. 
Um, but nevertheless, the power goes down. The final final barrier to the vault opens, and and Ode to Joy swells, and you have lens flare upon lens flare. You have lights. You have the hero shot of of Hans, finally pleased that something's gone his way, and the vault opens for everyone. See, and I have to say, okay, first I loved the scene mm. with the the music swelling. It it made me laugh. It it made me really enjoy the moment and really kind of feel happy for Hans even though I don't root for bad guys ever but he was finally getting what he wanted but it did take me out of the movie just a little bit because I did not find it plausible at all that just turning off the power would open the vault because that just I mean I know there were six other fail safes before we mm -hmm. got to that point but that just seems like a major major oversight from the security perspective of this vault yeah the power goes down and the doors are set to open you know, is it expected that they would open except for the other locks? You know, and the power's down. How are they opening? Right, right. Yeah. Um, so it, that, you know, pulled me out of the story for a few minutes because I was just annoyed that that was, it was too easy. Yeah, that is the, the pseudoscience, pseudo-technology of a, an 80s film, I think. <laughs> okay, I can whistle past that then. Right. Hans has got into the vault. He's happy. Everything's going well. He sends uh, people off to the roof because the helicopters are finally coming in from the FBI. And at this point, he realizes that Holly Gennaro is actually Holly McLean, and he takes her with him. Everyone else has to go up to the roof. John and Carl are fighting. Um, they, they spend probably about 20 minutes of the film fighting, back and forth, back and forth. John gets shot, he hits the other guy, and eventually he strings him up. And you have uh, a, a brief scene, but what's quite important for the rest of the film, John on the roof and John off the roof. And it's really strange, when he goes up to the roof, he is not looking to save the hostages particularly. He runs up there and he is asking for Holly Gennaro. He is interested in finding her, and when she's not there, then he helps everyone else. That is true. I I noticed that, but it didn't strike me as being anti-heroic or anything, because his whole, his whole purpose of being there was for Holly. So, of course, she's the first thing he's going to think of, trying to make sure that she's safe. Yes, and he's not he's not even bothered about stopping the terrorists at this point. It is all Holly. That's that's his goal, his aim, his uh, MacGuffin throughout the film, saving Holly. <laughs> and now the roof's been blown up. Uh, he's hidden in the, the replica falling water. All the terrorists are dead, except for the guard and Theo and Hans. And you get the showdown. And he looks like absolute hell. Um, Holly even <laughs> tells him as much. Which, after everything he's done for her, a bit of gratitude, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and you have that showdown, uh, which is, it's not bombastic, it's not big, it's not shooting and hiding and things breaking and everything that we've had up to, to now. It is two bullets and a few one-liners. What, what we end up with, once Alan Rittman's been shot and he's, full, he, uh, he's holding on to Holly... And you have to get the Rolex, again, Chekhov's Rolex from the very beginning of the film that Ellis has given her. It's the, it's the undoing of that clasp that takes Hans down. Right. And it's actually the undoing of the clasp. The Rolex doesn't break, so any product placement is still good. It still looks nice. It shines well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm sure, though, the watch plummets 30 stories to the ground. I'm sure it cracked, you know, when it, when it hit, so... Oh, maybe a scuff. Maybe a scuff. <laughs> but if you ask the Rolex people, they would say it would be fine. Still working 70 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and you have the, the kiss and the embrace between Holly and John as he's saved her and he's finally got rid of the terrorists. And we then we then start a series of codas. We have the, the meeting with Al. You have the resurrection and, and destruction of Carl by Al. You have the uh, news reporter, who we've not really mentioned. Bit of comic relief there, but we then have the news reporter being taken out by Holly. And finally we have Argyle, who has done his own bit in taking down Theo, driving them off and having a little wise crack about what New Year's must be like. <laughs> I liked Argyle. He's comic relief, to be sure. <laughs> Very much so. So, good film. Lots of silliness, lots of action as we go through. And there's a, there's a lot of things that actually I think we can talk about through it when we look at it in terms of theme and when we look at it in terms of the, the narrative construct of it. Okay. Um, I, I do want to ask you a question before we really start getting 
into the specifics. Uh, this movie came out almost 30 years ago. So oh, why <laughs> why do you think it has remained such a fan favorite? Why is it still so popular 30 years later? I think it appeals to everything you might want from a movie. If, if you can stand an action film. Um, I said that I watched this uh, when I was a child. And as a child, I, I thought childish thoughts. And I loved that bombast. I loved the wise cracking nature of John McClane. I loved the coolness of Hans. Some of those moments that I called out. The opening of the vault. And the little uh, set pieces of shooting glass and so on. It's, it's got everything you might want for uh, emotional reward. To actually enjoy the film. And then it's also set at Christmas. And Christmas is a time when you watch films. You know, People are looking for you. Know, what's the Christmas film you go to? What's the thing to make you happy and feel like family? So it's got that built into it already. And then if you want to go even deeper, it's got some of this theme work, some of this great character, some of this development going on there. And I think um, it's really good to talk a bit about character in this film. I said earlier, it redefined the way that heroes and villains are written in action films. And particularly Hans Gruber is one of the greatest villains ever created. Uh, if, you, if you're talking about great villains, you can reference Darth Vader. You can reference uh, Hannibal Lecter or a Kaiser Soze. But alongside them, Alan Rickman's first villain, which is basically the, the same character he then plays in a number of other films, is one of the greats. The chap who wrote the screenplay, um, I've got a great quote from him where he said that, uh, who is the, the protagonist of Die Hard? It's Hans Gruber who plans the robbery. So if we're talking about protagonists, people who drive a plot forward and actually uh, make things happen, it's his rival when things change. If he doesn't turn up at the party, all that happens is, well, to be frank, chances are Holly and John get divorced, and he sees his, <laughs> sees his kids on holidays. Um, he right. cannot stop his mouth from running away with him. Right. But he arrives and he gives uh, this East Coast American hero the opportunity to shine and show what he does best. And even uh, the music, I talked about the swell of Ode to Joy when, when Hans uh, you know, gets his treasure, gets his reward. We're supposed to feel for him. We're supposed to go, oh, this is a great hero. This is someone we're rooting for. You know, the, the attack by the SWAT team doesn't go well for the police. But if you're rooting for the villains, it's a great moment. It's a moment of triumph and they're doing really well. So a lot of the film is designed to actually uh, root for the villain and to want him to succeed and that's a really good start that's not something a lot of films put any uh, care and attention into right one of my very first thoughts when alan rickman came on the screen was i don't usually root for villains but alan rickman may change my mind yes. because and, and i will say i i didn't understand what his plan was for most of the movie i i didn't know why he was there what he was trying to do, he was so well-dressed, so posh and polished <laughs> that he's not your normal criminal. He's not your normal thief. And so when when it was finally revealed that he was there to steal the $640 million in bonds, my first thought was, oh, that's kind of boring. He's just there to take the money. But then the longer that he was there and and just kind of seeing everything that was going on and, and how he was so adept at misdirection, mm -hmm. you know, bringing in the political um, hostages the and things like that, mm -hmm. trying, trying to indicate that that's really what he was doing as a distraction. You know, he was brilliant. He really was. And, and, and I can, I can appreciate that about him, even though, you know, at the end of the day, I did really want Bruce Willis to win. <laughs> I appreciated Hans Gruber and everything he was trying to do. Yeah, and, and his plan is not just stealing, it's getting away with. You know, he's thought end to end how this is going to work and how he ends up earning his money from it. I, you know, I would like to see a mini prequel to this movie that kind of tells us how Hans Gruber gathered all of these people together to work with him or rather for him because they were so different. I don't really understand what was in it for Carl versus what was in it for Theo versus what was in it for Hans. And I would love to see that story <laughs> to kind of understand why they're doing what they're doing and how they all came together. Like a kind of Ocean's Eleven, but Gruber's Twelve. Yes, 13, maybe. <laughs> absolutely. I think that would be a fun story to tell. 
And we could do it a bit like Rogue One. Gruber's 13, a diehard story. Yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, we can't now because, you know, poor Alan Rickman's not with us anymore. Yeah. And no one else can play that character. No. But that that would have been a fun story to see come to life. And I think it would have helped me understand Hans better. And I would have liked to have understood him better. And and you're right, we get very little backstory about how he knows all this. How does he know what the FBI playbook is? How does he know what the response is going to be? You know, he makes a couple of references to, you know, the suits and to reading magazines. So he's obviously very well groomed. <clears throat> but this sort of uh, martial detail doesn't get any explanation at all. Right. Do you think it helps or hinders the film that we don't get that? Both, which I know okay. is, is not is not a good answer. But on on the one hand, you know, he, he has this air of mystery about him and he's very confident and cocky and arrogant. And so you just trust that he knows what he's talking about and it doesn't really matter how he knows. But on the other hand, it can take you out of the story just a little bit while you're trying to ponder, well, how does he know and why is he here and what's the point of all of this? So it, it's an interesting dichotomy, I think, but... At least in the way my nerdy brain works, I can see it both ways. <laughs> you want to know everything about everyone. Always. Yes. <laughs> and, and of course, if we're talking about characters, there's McLean himself. He is uh, breaking the mold here. He's smart mouth, wise guy. But action heroes of the time were, I think, like you said, Harrison Ford, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Sloan. They are muscle bound. They are uh, not as smart mouth, certainly not as smart all the time. Or they're skilled warriors and they've got, you know, all these really technical skills that get them through what they're going to do. He is a, an East Coast New York beat cop who puts scumbags away. Which is perfectly valid, I think. I, I think that for this kind of story, that's the kind of character you need. You need somebody who's going to go in there and, one, try to stop the bad guys, try to save... The, the hostages and two who is willing to get dirty and do what needs to be done and I think his background as a beat cop gives him both of those things rather than the Steven Seagal or Jean-Claude Van Damme or mm. you know Arnold Schwarzenegger type of person who just uses brute force to punch his way through yeah and, and the other names you mentioned at the beginning I can't imagine Burt Reynolds or Richard Gere doing this part Oh no! All I can, all I can picture Richard Gere doing now is like Pretty Woman, which came out around the same time. Mm. Um, I don't think it was exactly 1988, but it was around the same time. And I I cannot visualize him in this kind of action role. He's just a little bit too polished, and Bruce Willis has never been polished. No, that's that's a fair comment, I think. <laughs> One of the things I noticed in this movie was that names seem to be important, but I'm not sure if that was intentional or if there's some deeper meaning that we mm -hmm. were supposed to get from those names. Um, primarily, there's John McClane. And, and, and every time I've referenced him in this podcast so far, I have called him John McClane, not John. He, in the movie, he's very rarely called John. It's always John McClane. In pop culture, it's John McClane. And it's, that's his identity. It, he's not John. He's not McLean. He is John McLean. Why? Why do you think that is? Why? Why do you think it's so important that it's very specifically John McLean for him? But Holly. Well, and you know what? The same thing with Holly. Holly mm -hmm. wasn't just Holly. She was Holly Gennaro, and I can understand part of that was because of. John McClane's frustration with her having gone back to her maiden name, but it was a very specific identity that embraced more than just a first or last name. Hans was Hans a few times, uh, for example, Happy Trails Hans, but most of the time he was also Hans Gruber. And so we get these names over and over again that are very specific and, and I'm not sure, do you think that that was intentional in the writing or if that just kind of came about in production? I, th I think John being used all the time is, is going back to that everyman point. 
you know, if we're talking the escapism of movies and, and uh, putting yourself in the hero and watching it as he goes through, uh, it's it's you know, John Doe is the generic name for someone you don't know. So uh, that's a nice way of making him that everyman. Holly, uh, I can't look past the, the Christmas reference in her name, but you're absolutely right. The the battle going on for her last name is quite important, and that's uh, even used as the point of his his smart uh, smart mouth at the beginning. <laughs> um, you know, you didn't miss my name when you were signing all those checks. <laughs> right. and, and everyone just groans at that point because you know it's a stupid m- comment he knows it's a stupid comment but it's not going to help anyone right but it's it's a respect thing um i think more than anything he he doesn't have a name he's just there helping out and trying to do his best was everyone else is mr takagi and she she's uh got her own name she's built her own life for herself out there uh, and hans is of course uh mr gruber hans he commands the respect of everyone around him yeah I, I will say I didn't pick up on this until you you mentioned this earlier today. When Al asks for John's name over the radio, John doesn't tell him his actual name. He tells him call him Roy, and you link that back to Roy Rogers, mm. which makes perfect sense because John keeps being referred to as a cowboy in this, and I did not make that reference. the The link to that just didn't happen for me until you said that, but now I think it's brilliant. Yeah, and all the way through, he's referenced with different things, the the Mr. Mystery Guest and Roy. And you, you've even got the, the trying to figure out what his uh, background is. Is he a security guard? Is he a bartender? Is he a cop? Right. So I, I just, I feel like identity has a lot to do with what's going on in this movie, in addition to the surface action, trying to figure out who they are and how they become who they are. So I think that gives us um, a, a way of moving into the big theme of, of the movie. Uh, all the way through the movie, we have these opposites. We have cops and robbers. We have East Coast coming to the West Coast. We have European terrorists and American businessmen. We have Japanese businessmen and American businessmen. We have the rap music and the classical music. We have the greed. And then we have John's you know, altruism trying to save everyone. The big one, the one that that goes through everything in the film, is the masculine against the the metrosexual. And I've been I've been trying to find a different word than metrosexual because that's a very modern phrase and probably not something we had in the eighties. The closest I can come is yuppie, that uh, you know suited, good hair, good nails, you know never done a hard day's uh, work but always sat at a desk, uh, Patrick Bateman esque <laughs> character. Right. Um, I'm realizing now that's a reference that we're we're going to pick up in a uh, few months, probably, when we get to American Psycho. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, But that you have all these men all the way through who are pretty is not the right word, but they are charming. They're well dressed. They're very smart. They're successful in the financial firms. They're polished. Exactly. And and in the middle of all this is Holly. So you have um, Takagi who is the one who actually takes Holly away. He's brought her over, and she has made a success of this herself. You have Ellis, who gives her the Rolex, and who, you know, he makes a comment to her. He's thinking mold wine and a, a ripe brie, because he's a prat. Um, <laughs> and finally, you have you have Hans Gruber, who is the one who actually takes her with him. He grabs her and, and hauls her away. But in the end, it's... You know, she has to relinquish the Rolex, and that's what gets rid of them. She gets rid of uh, the yuppie. She casts off her greed and her need for things. She embraces this, uh, you know, dirty, beaten American man. And she even then sublimates to him by taking on his name to show that she is his. And the the whole film is this thing of, you know, he is a man's man. He gets on with the the cab driving Argyle. Uh, He he notices the, the girly calendar on the wall more than anything else in the building. He doesn't want to drink the champagne. And in the end, he's the one who wins Holly from everyone. And I'd love to talk about feminism in Die Hard and its treatment of women and, and the character of Holly. But before that, I think the thing I want to ask is, am I ruining it? Should we actually read these th- these themes into a film like Die Hard? You know, it's fun. I've, I've said it's bombastic. But if I start using words like erudite and metrosexual and sublimation, <laughs> am I taking away from what's just a good yarn from the 80s? I don't think so. I think that your experience is enhanced the deeper you go into a movie. And a movie that is entertaining on its own, on the surface, 
can most likely become even better when you do start diving into those themes. I feel like this conversation is just making me appreciate the movie even more. I mean, I loved it from a purely entertainment perspective, but also thinking about the dichotomies that you were just talking about between John and Hans or John and Takagi and, and all of the things that were going on, they bring a better understanding of the characters, of the story, of of your own understanding mm. and I appreciate that good I'm glad I'm not ruining it for everyone <laughs> well you're not for me and this is my podcast so we both win okay <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that stood out to me in this movie was its visual effects mm. you know and and I was not at all surprised to find out that this movie was nominated for Oscars in those more physical um, categories like sound and film editing and, and those sorts of things because I kept forgetting that this movie was made in 1988. To me, the sound and the sound effects and the visual effects, the es- explosions, all of those things were really well done. The only thing that really kept me grounded in the fact that this movie was from the 80s was, of course, the clothes. I mean, (laughs) Holly was rocking those shoulder pads. And there was, of course, very outdated technology when they showed the computer screens and things like that. Though I was surprised. I had no idea touchscreens were in existence in 1988. So I I was pretty excited when he had to do the touchscreen to find Holly in the directory. I, I... honestly had no idea that was a thing in 1988 yeah the director is a great idea when the building's in use but they're the only people in the building so he still has to look them up and then the guard says oh yeah they're the only ones here go up to the 30th <laughs> <laughs> right right when, when we talk about moments that throw me out that's just showing off a, the, the thing with her name that's all they're looking for there <laughs> right if the film was made today do you think it would be different than it is if you had a mobile phone in there for, for John, would it have been different? I think that if the film had been made today, they would have had, Hans would have had some sort of technology to block cell phone signals. And so he still wouldn't have been able to use a phone to call anybody. Yeah. I think, I, I, I think that honestly, it probably would have mostly gone down the same way that it did. I mean, the technology would probably be a little bit different. The locks blocking the vault would have been a little bit different. But, I mean, like I said, I I kept forgetting this movie was made in the 80s, and so I really don't see a lot of how it would be different. Because if, it, if we'd had the technology, the communications technology of today, cell phones, internet, Wi-Fi, all of those things, Hans would have been prepared. I mean, he was prepared enough to bring rocket launchers to the party. He was going to be prepared enough to (laughs) knock out all forms of communication. And so we still would have ended up on a handheld radio, assuming, of course, that there were any in the building. I I think you're dead right there. I think that gives us part of the answer to, to the question you asked me earlier about why it's so enduring. You could, you could imagine this happening now. You can imagine this being a new film and still going exactly the same way. Uh, modern sensibilities might change. You know, We might get more of the backstory, more of the detail. But yeah, everything that happens, happens in the same way. I, I, they'd probably have quieter guns so that I wouldn't be able to hear them down the street. Do and... they make silencers for machine guns? Oh, probably. Yes, let's say <laughs> I don't know. I'm British. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. So, <laughs> yeah. So, before we move on to the next point I have in the doc, you did say earlier that you wanted to talk about feminism and the treatment of women. Mm-hmm. And I don't actually see that we come back to that in the rest of the doc. So, is that something that you still want to talk about? I We, we talked about characters and how great Hans is. We talked about how great John McClane is. Holly is one of the best written women in an action film possibly ever she is not bowed by hans you know he says what idiot put you in charge and she tells him it was him Uh, she (laughs) calls out yeah exactly she calls out how stupid he is for for just wanting to rob things she is not bowed by him she has moved out to uh, los angeles with her children she has a good nanny who 
possibly she shouldn't have <laughs> but she she has her children her children are happy they're smart enough to answer the phone very politely uh, they have a good relationship there's no problems there we are told in the text that she is the the reason for the big deal they've just won you know a lot of it is, is down to her you know the all the other men in it want her whether it's for business or they want her as a partner or they want her as leverage over john she's something of a MacGuffin, but as a character she's just so well written Okay, so twice now in this podcast, you've used the word MacGuffin. So will okay. you explain to our <laughs> listeners who may not be familiar with that term what it means? MacGuffin is, and I'm trying to think of a good example of it, a device in a film that is there for the effect of it, that people want for, uh, for, the, for the purpose of having it. Uh, I'm trying to see if I have a better, better example to use than uh, Holly Gennaro. <laughs> I, I believe it's originally from a uh, Hitchcock film or something of okay. that era. So the here's a good example is the necklace in Titanic. You know, it's it's a thing that triggers the memories and is um is used as the thing they want to steal throughout the film. Okay, that makes sense. So it's, I, it's... I hear it a lot, and in context, I understand what it means. I just never really knew where it came from or what specifically it was supposed to be. So thank you for that yes. little bit of knowledge. An, an item that has nothing of its own particularly. No narrative explanation necessarily, but it's it's there and everyone wants it. And, and I think Holly fits in that, but she's not just a damsel. She's not a princess. She's not powerless. She does her own thing, and she stands up to the men who, who want her in that way. I think maybe I want to be Holly Gennaro when I grow up. <laughs> Holly McLean. Rocks. Holly McLean. Mm. So one of the things I noticed about this movie, at least for the majority of the first half, was that there was very little in the way of dialogue. Uh, Bruce Willis's character in particular, once the heist started and he was locked down alone, he really had no dialogue apart from his conversations with himself. And I, I found that very striking, though in an action movie, I suppose it shouldn't be very surprising, but it wasn't something that I expected when going into a film like this to see very little in the way of dialogue. Absolutely, and actually, uh, the the way that we talked about not knowing anything of Hans's past, we don't get that exposition about characters. Occasionally, we go off to talk about hostages in the in the news studio, or get something from the police, but because of that, there's nothing of that. It's been excised from the film. Um, you're right; it comes down to being shown a lot rather than told a lot. And as a, a slight side note, I, I had a, a flick through the script online because uh, I thought I wanted to pull out a few quotes for us to use. The script online is very different than the script in the film. There is a lot of editing work that went on to cut it down to what we see. And there's a lot of uh, more textual evidence for some of the, some of the things we've shown. There's a, a whole flirty com conversation at the beginning with one of the air stewardesses to show us that you know, he's a man's man that women want. But we don't need that. We just need the look. And it's good enough and we can move on. And, right, and, well, and that look was good enough. I, I, I think I'm glad they cut that out. Yeah. And there's even something that I thought was a very modern phenomenon. Again, Rogue One is a, a big ev big evidence of this. There is dialogue in the trailer for Die, Die Hard that is not in the film. Really? Which is something I always think of as, you know, certainly since 2000. Um, I think Mission Impossible was one of the first films that I noticed that from, or Mission Impossible 2. But there is a, a moment from the scene where Hans is pretending to be Bill Clay... And he says to John, are you sure you're American? And John goes, does New Jersey count? It's funny. Yeah, well, it's funny if you're American, but it doesn't add anything to it. So I can completely understand taking it out. But really but interesting I, that it was in the trailer. I feel like that was in the version I watched last night or two nights ago. I remember that line. I need to go back. Maybe on. I'm making it up. <laughs> Sometimes I misremember things, but I feel like I remember him saying that. I don't remember that, so I, I want to go back and look now. It's a joke that when I saw it in the trailer, I thought, I've never seen this moment. I am 99% <laughs> sure it was in the version I watched. And if it is in there, you can cut this whole section from the podcast. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> Mia culpa, if it is. <laughs> <laughs> but 
the the dialogue that we do get is you know throughout your notes you're just writing down lines from the film yippee ki yay and welcome to the party pal happy trails hans now i have a machine gun too ho 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 (laughs) yeah i mean it there are great one-liners in this Mm. for sure and in fact I did write down all four of those in my notes because they just delighted me. Yeah, all the way through. There's just such great uh, bits of dialogue. But a lot of it, uh, a lot of things that we might be told through exposition, through characters talking to each other and saying, oh, have you taken down that lock? No, I haven't done that. I need to get the FBI to do this. Not there. Let's just make an oblique reference to it and let it happen when it happens. Right. It takes a combination of a very skilled writer a skilled director and a skilled producer to make that happen the way that it did, I think. Yes. And and when it comes to editing and and actually taking out just bare moments, but still letting the point they wanted it and wanted it to carry stand. It's excellent. Which is probably why it was nominated for an Academy Award for film editing. Absolutely. (laughs) So I have a question for you. Okay, go on. Do you think there's any significance to John McClane's bare feet throughout the entire movie. He did try to get shoes from the dead terrorist, but they ended up being too small for him. Feet smaller than his sister. (laughs) Yes. And an interesting side note was in the book that the movie is based on, the character remained barefoot because he couldn't stand the thought of wearing a dead, dead man's shoes rather than them actually being too small. But in both instances, that decision makes John or Joe in the book have to remain barefoot throughout Mm. the entire rest of the movie. Is that just so that we can have that scene with him pulling glass out of his feet? Is there another reason? Does it, does it tie back to um, the very, the opening of the movie where he's told by his fellow passenger on the plane that in order to kind of, relax and rejuvenate after a flight you you know you take your shoes off and you do the toe fist in the carpet is it intended to just be something that looks really cool or is there really a deeper significance the the passenger next to him at the beginnings uh, a bit fascinating to dive into he is i i would say he's like a lot of the nakatomi executives you know he i, I from memory he looks a bit smarter um mm-hmm. he's quite genial he's prepared to talk to uh john and he even gives him this advice because he thinks he's afraid of flying and maybe he's afraid of flying maybe he's afraid of seeing holly but the... i assumed he was afraid of flying in fact my very first note was bruce willis should not be afraid of flying <laughs> <laughs> But at, at this point in his career, he was not Bruce Willis, in inverted commas. He is just an actor. <laughs> that chap from Fair Moonlight. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but the, the chap on the plane is also afraid of the gun, and he's worried about what John's going to do. And he's set at ease when he finds out he's a policeman. So it's, again, a bit of that uh, the dichotomy between you know, the white-collar and the blue-collar worker. And John is taking the advice of this person. Mm-hmm. which is a, a nice moment. You know, he is on his own prepared to learn from people, even though he's a street smart know-it-all. But I'm not sure there is anything more into it other than they wanted that scene of him, him, you know, bruised and beaten and pulling shards of glass from his feet and bearing his soul at the same time. I, I think that's the crux they wanted around it and they just had to keep it in our memory, the reference with, you know, seeing Bill Clay spot that so that we understand what happens when he shoots the glass. Right. Well, and I feel like throughout the movie, the camera showed us a lot of shots of his bare feet while he was running um, up and down stairs, through hallways. Mm-hmm. It They never let us forget that he didn't have shoes on. And I think that's why the question arose in my mind. Is it a pure identification thing? Bruce Willis is not a famous enough actor, and, and he... I think he still has hair for some of this, um, so he's you know, not necessarily identifiable against some of the terrorists. So let's give him a, a character feature that allows us to spot him. You know, that thing of, of the, the Skeksis in uh, the Dark Crystal who makes a funny noise so we know he's the Chamberlain. Okay. Perhaps. Although we could Crystal? just be giving them... I have not. Okay. 
<laughs> that reference just totally went over my head. Remember when I steal other people's references and dialogue to make my own? That's one of them. Yes. <laughs> it really only works when uh, the person you're talking to gets it. <laughs> Which may be difficult for me when we're on a podcast called Pop Culturally Deprived. So. Yes. I'll, I'll just call them out as I get there. The the Chamberlain, the, the Skeksis in Dark Crystal are uh, Jim Henson puppets. And they are fabulous puppets, but they all look very similar. So one of them, the, the main one that we follow around, makes a high-pitched noise every so often. And that's how you know when it's him and not one of the others. Okay. That's... Well, I wonder, though, are we giving are we giving the filmmakers too much credit with that? Or are we not? You know, I just, I, I don't know. It was made 30 years ago, so. <laughs> people were dumb 30 years ago, so. <laughs> uh, people are dumb now. True. So. No, I think it's, uh, it is a beautifully shot film. Some of, some of the shots that they do, uh, some of the things they throw in, the way that we uh, look at Hans as though he's a hero all the way through those shots, you know, looking upwards at him, the power that he stands over everyone, even the, the top of the stairs in the, the office section. Right. You know, there's, there's a lot in that. It's very striking imagery. And that the bare feet is one of the things that people take away from this film. So definitely meant to uh, be something you take. Okay, I, I can accept that. So my next question, of course, was about the machine guns, but I think we've kind of exhausted that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> there were machine guns that stood out to you. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sure it did take up five or six of your notes just thinking on that one point. <laughs> it did. <laughs> It did. I went back to it after after Al went into the lobby and they were still shooting. Like I was perfectly fine with him standing in the lobby and not hearing gunfire in the building 30 plus stories up. I get that. There's a lot of insulation between him and those guns. But I still just cannot get past him being outside and not hearing machine guns on the roof. That's going to bother me until the day that I die. It bothers me more in films like this. The fact that people are such bad shots. They have machine guns, and he has no cover, and they still fail to hit him. <laughs> well, he was running, you know. <laughs> is, is there anything to that we should read into this about it being set at Christmas, or about it being released in July? I think that it's a plot point that it's set at Christmas, because that is really, that is what gets him to L.A. He is going, because it's Christmas, to see his wife and his kids. You know, it... It wouldn't make as much sense at a different time of the year for him to just randomly go. I mean, yes, from a familiar familial perspective, you would hope that he would go see his kids as often as possible. But, you know, this gives a very concrete, specific reason. It's Christmas time, so he's going to see his kids. And so I, I, I don't have a problem with that. As far as it being released in July... An interesting fun fact is that mm -hmm. Miracle on 34th Street was released in May of 1947. Really? And then the Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire movie Holiday Inn mm -hmm. was released in August of 1942. So I, I don't think Christmas movies have to be released at Christmas. It has become more and more commonplace. But I think the setting of the film has more to do with whether or not it's a Christmas movie than the day it was released. Yes, and I think, as you said earlier, it is now a perennial favourite to watch at this time of year. The music throughout is, it just calls to the time of year uh, for, for both the English, uh, American and Japanese watchers. The, the let it snow at the end and the jingle bells that he hums as he goes through. It, it's rooted in there and he's trying to save someone called Holly. And I found an interesting thing when I was doing the research. The use of Ode to Joy throughout is something that's uh, traditionally played at the end of year in Japan. Oh, Apparently I did not know that. It stems back to uh, musicians wanting to earn money and it being a, a thing that everyone knew how to do. So they would always put on concerts for it. Well, it's a beautiful song. And I, mm. I really enjoyed listening to the music throughout this. Um, even though one of my very first comments was, wow, this is a very 80s and 90s soundtrack. Uh, but that was really just because of the music played at the very beginning in the limo ride. And the, the music Argyle was playing in the limo throughout. Mm -hmm. But the rest of it was scored beautifully with the variations of Ode to Joy and the Christmas carols, you know, fading in and out. And, and I really enjoyed it. 
Mm. It's all, all pieces you know, so it's, it's, it makes it an easy watch. And uh, Argyle, I know we were going to uh, try and talk about him earlier, but I, I quite like his sort of Eddie Murphy streetwise attitude. And again, he's a lovely opposite to Theo, who's got that sort of Huxtable style, you know, nice sweater and glasses. And he's the intellectual one of all of the uh, the criminals. Right. I I appreciated Argyle because he had John's back when it came to the whole relationship stuff. He was willing to mm-hmm. stay just in case things didn't go well and he needed a ride somewhere else. And, you know, and, you know, he was a stranger and he was still willing, you know, and, and part of it was so he didn't have to go do another job. Of course, he's a kid. That's, that's <laughs> what you do. But still, he had John's back and he proved that whenever he took out Theo at the end. And I thought that was great. Yeah, he really steps up, and then he even gets the final quip of the film about what happens at New Year's. Right, <laughs> right. So you enjoyed watching Die Hard? Has this set you up to watch the uh, the, the next few films in the series? I, I'm i not sure. I think um, probably definitely Die Hard 2, but I, I haven't seen very good things about 3, 4, and 5. Okay. <laughs> online. So it'll it'll just depend partially on whether or not you recommend the entire series or if I should, you know, watch two and then stop. Number two is the typical sequel. You know, they're trying to do the same sort of thing, but bigger. Number three is probably my favorite in the series. Oh, OK. It has a, a villain as good as Alan Rickman. Who plays the villain in that one? That is someone whose name I can't remember that I should be able to remember. Who played Scar in The Lion King? Jeremy Irons. Okay, okay. Is that the is Samuel L. Jackson in that one? He he's in one lead. of them, right? He, he's in that one, and he's excellent as well. Okay. Well, then I may have to add, at the very least, two and three to my list of things to watch. And maybe we can come back and do a, a mini sequel to this episode and kind of wrap up discussions on the, the franchise as a whole. See what you think of them. Some, sometime in the future. Absolutely. We, we can probably skip four and five. Uh, number four has Kevin Smith in it. Oh, dear. Which, which might tell you everything you want to know about it. <laughs> well, I did watch Clerks for the first time last night uh, for a future podcast episode. And yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm okay with skipping that one. You have no words. <laughs> None at all. You need to come up with some some for your clerks episode. <laughs> um, I I will say there is okay. There's one thing that I found out about this movie um, while I was doing my research that we didn't talk about that I just want to mention because I think it's really cool. Go on. That final shot of Hans before he falls. Mm-hmm. When I was watching it, I was thinking, wow, he just doesn't look scared at all. He's so arrogant, he doesn't even think that he's going to fall. And then his face changes as he falls. Mm -hmm. And you can just see him going from perfectly calm to perfectly freaked out. And the reason why is because he, of course, the way it was shot, he did the stunt himself. He was dropped 25 feet onto one of those big air mattress things. Okay. And they told him that on the count of three, they were going to let him go. And so he was mentally prepared to be let go (laughs) on the count of three. They let him go at one. (laughs) So that reaction was 100% absolutely genuine. And that made me love it so much more. Excellent. That is, uh, and, and you can see it. He suddenly knows he's falling, and you can see the the stomach goes, and he gets that big drop ahead of him. Yes. That's a great, um, the, the super high s- slow motion speed. <laughs> yeah, and, and that whole scene it stood out to me because the entire movie he was so arrogant. He, there was no way in his mind he was going to fail, and even when he is dangling from this building, you can still see it on his face. He does not believe that he is going to fail. He is still going to get out of this. And so that split second when he realizes that he's falling, it just, it took it over the top for me, and I loved it. That's great. We're, we're seeing our protagonist fall to his death. <laughs> I suppose he really, he for the definition of protagonist, he really was, mm-hmm. even though I still prefer to keep John in that role because I'm a nerd. <laughs> John's our hero. 
He, he is very much our hero. Yes. Well, is there anything that we've missed? Have we exhausted our conversation on Die Hard? We have exhausted everything of Die Hard, I think. I think we have taken it and picked all the bare bones, uh, and all that's left is the, uh, the tearing away the wrapping. All right. Well, I will be back next week with another episode of Pop Culturally Deprived, where Matthew and I will be discussing Pulp Fiction. Until then, please remember to rate and review us on iTunes. If you want to get in touch, you can follow me on Twitter at Mandy K. You can email me at Mandy K at popculturallydeprived.com, or you can comment on this post on popculturallydeprived.com. You can also find Matthew on Twitter at Matthew Vos. Until next time, I'm Mandy K. And I'm an exceptional thief, Mrs. McLean. 